Namo tasa bhagavato arhato samma samputasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arhato samma samputasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arhato samma samputasa. Buddhang dhammang sangang namasami. So, right speech. Uh, so first off, it's important to recognize that right speech um, is within the context of the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, so the Buddha doesn't normally talk about right speech in, in isolation, um, but rather as part of the overall framework uh, of Buddhist practice. So right speech is meant to be built upon right view and right intention. Uh, it's not something that, that we just do for its own sake. And it's not something that's done without a foundation, but rather it's built upon the foundation of of Samaditti, which is right view or right understanding, uh, and samasankappa, which is right attitude uh, or right intention. Uh, without this foundation uh, of right view and right attitude, uh, then right speech is uh, actually quite difficult to do effectively. Uh, and also there's very little reason to, to practice right speech at all. So starting with right view, so one of the, the critical aspects of right view is an understanding of, of karma, uh, of causality. Uh, so this is one of the fundamental underpinnings of, of Buddhist thought uh, and Buddhist practice, uh, which is that in every single moment we make choices, and those choices shape our experience of reality. That's basically what karma means. So karma uh, literally means action. Uh, so it's the actions that we take, whether physical, verbal, or mental, uh, which then lead to results, to effects, to co consequences, uh, which in Pali is called vipaka. Uh, so the Buddha normally spoke about karma together with vipaka. So karma is action uh, or choice. Vipaka is result effect. Uh, so cause and effect, action and result, choice and consequence. So we normally spoke about these things. So these days we tend to use the word karma uh, a lot more loosely in a way that encompasses both sides of this. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that when the Buddha was talking he used these two distinctly different terms. So karma is choice, uh, a intentional action, uh, and vipaka is consequence or result of those choices, those actions. Uh, so right view then, it's recognizing that uh, what we're currently experiencing is the result of choices we've made in the past. And the choices that we're making now will determine what we experience in the future. And actually, the choices that we make now will experience what we're, uh, will affect what we're experiencing right now as well, for that matter. Uh, so we can talk about choices which have an immediate effect, uh, choices which have a long-term effect, uh, and choices which have both, which both have an immediate result and also a long-term result. And these are things that we can see for ourselves. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you say an insult to someone uh, or if you speak in a harsh mm, tone to someone, then you can see an immediate result. Uh, you might see a look of, of hurt or uh, sadness or confusion uh, on the other person's face. Um, you might feel the unpleasantness in your own mind. You might feel that tone of, of pain and, and discomfort in your own mind uh, that arises as a direct consequence of having done something harmful. Even while engaging in harsh speech or while delivering a, an insulting statement, um, even during that action you might recognize the discomfort that you're experiencing uh, as a result of, of engaging in, in harmful speech. Uh, even prior to saying uh, anything harmful, uh, hopefully 
uh, you might notice the intention to say something harmful, the intention to be harsh or insulting or crude or, or thoughtless or inconsiderate. And you might notice that that intention itself is also unpleasant. It carries with it a, a, the tone of, of dukkha, this tone of, of discomfort, of discontent, uh, of unsettledness, of unhappiness. So looking at the mind closely, uh, we can see here that the effects of our choices, uh, namely the results of our karma, uh, are not always things that we experience somewhere distant in the future. They're also things that we can notice to some extent right in the immediate present moment. Things that we can notice uh, either right at the point of making a choice or within uh, a very short period of time afterwards. Uh, but we can also see longer-term consequences of the choices that we make. Uh, if we consistently speak in a harsh, unkind way to others, if we consistently speak in a divisive, uh, malicious, uh, insulting, critical way to others, uh, then what are the long-term effects that we'll notice? Uh, well, we'll notice that it shapes the kind of relationships that we have with people. Uh, we might notice that the kind, gentle, friendly people in our lives start to become more distant from us. They're less likely to want to spend time with us, want to converse with us. Uh, they become more remote from us. Uh, similarly, mm, as we uh, engage in this, this kind of harsh, unkind, hostile speech, uh, you also notice a change in the character of your own mind. Uh, so over a period of time, then your own mind becomes more and more inclined towards uh, hostility. Uh, the underlying character of the mind tends to become more aversive, uh, more irritable, more agitated. Uh, it's, uh, again, that, that tone of dukkha, uh, of discomfort becomes stronger and stronger in the mind. It becomes more and more pervasive in the mind. Uh, and the habit of harmful speech becomes stronger. Uh, every time we engage in harmful speech, we build up the habit. Uh, the Buddha said, whatever we, uh, whatever we repeatedly do becomes the habit of the mind. Uh, so it's important to watch out for that. Uh, to notice how when we persistently engage in certain kinds of behavior, that then that makes us more and more likely to engage in that behavior in the future. Um, so like there's an old saying, uh, lightning never strikes the same place twice. It's actually totally wrong. It's the exact opposite. Lightning very, very often strikes the same place over and over and over again. Um, and in fact, uh, so why is this the case? Well, because lightning follows the path of least resistance. Um, so it's actually quite natural for it to strike repeatedly in the same place. So the more we build up uh, a tendency to behave in a particular way, the more likely we are to strike in the same way again in the future, because that's where we find the least resistance. That's where it's the easiest for us to behave, the easiest for us to make that, that choice, to follow that path. Uh, and uh, the Buddha also says that in the long run, then in future lives as well, we'll experience the consequences and, and negative results of engaging in harmful speech. Uh, so uh, he gives some interesting examples. For example, he says that uh, one who engages in a lot of harmful, abusive, unfriendly speech, uh, in future lives they'll be ugly. So anyone want to be ugly? Anyone? No? Not interested? Okay. Um, on the flip side, if one engages in kind, loving, friendly speech, then in future lives you'll be beautiful. Does that sound nice? Anyone want to be pretty? Anyone want to be beautiful? A couple of people? Only me? Okay. Uh, so, uh, and, and so the Buddha does give uh, a few very simple, straightforward examples of the workings of karma in this way. Uh, but more it's recognizing the tendency and pattern uh, of the mind, 
when we look at others who are engaging in, in harsh, unkind, hostile behavior, uh, we're usually not so interested in being around such people. We're not so interested in engaging with them. So we can recognize that the more we build up those aversive, negative, hostile patterns within ourselves, uh, that the more difficulty and, and struggle we're going to have in our interactions with other people, in our relationship with the world, as well as with our own mind. So this is the basis of right view. So from the basis of right view, we can already start to see uh, that there's some value to trying to practice right speech, uh, that there's some value to avoiding uh, wrong speech, avoiding harmful behavior, and instead cultivating right speech, uh, wholesome speech, beneficial speech. And next is right attitude or right intention. Uh, so the Buddha normally defines right attitude in terms of three mm, different attitudes of mind. Uh, first is the attitude of renunciation uh, or non-attachment. Uh, second one is the attitude of mm, non-harming uh, or loving kindness. And the third one is the attitude of non-cruelty uh, or compassion. So again, we cultivate these attitudes of mind these intentions or directions of mind because we already have some understanding of karma. We've already established right view to the extent that we see that there is benefit and value uh, to cultivating a wholesome mind, uh, to cultivating a, uh, a gentle mind, a loving mind. Uh, and uh, also recognizing that contentment and self-restraint are a source of happiness. Uh, a source of wisdom, uh, a source of goodness. So the attitude of, of mm, loving kindness and compassion uh, are fairly straightforward. It's not too difficult to see the benefits and values of those. So when we have an attitude of not wanting to cause harm, not wanting others to suffer, uh, instead cultivating the attitude of, of wanting others to be happy uh, and peaceful, uh, then we feel happy and joyful. Uh, because these attitudes are not just limited to others, they also include ourselves. So right attitude is wishing for everyone to be free of, of pain and suffering, wishing for everyone to be happy and content. So cultivating these, these attitudes makes uh, us within ourselves uh, more joyful, uh, more peaceful, uh, more pleasant. Uh, and also it makes it so that we have the, the proper foundation uh, for being kind and gentle and loving in our interactions with others as well. Uh, it sets up the foundation for harmonious, uh, gentle, mutually beneficial interactions and relationships. So it's fairly straightforward. The attitude of renunciation uh, can be a little bit harder to see, a little bit harder to understand, a little bit harder to relate to why it's important. Uh, and how it fits into the overall structure uh, of the path, particularly as it relates to, to speech, to right speech. So it can be worth relating to renunciation as contentment, first and foremost. Uh, so renunciation is about being content uh, with things as they are. So not thinking that we need to seek out something in particular or get something in particular, but being content with things as they are. Uh, it's also the practice of uh, recognizing the desires and impulses arising in the mind and seeing that we are not obligated to follow along. So, for example, uh, if we have a habit of engaging in harsh, uh, aversive speech, uh, maybe a habit of telling crude jokes or making snide remarks, uh, well, then we tend to associate a certain amount of pleasure with such things. Uh, we tend to see that there's, there's a certain amount of, of fun to be had uh, in making harsh or, or rude or aversive or grumpy um, statements. Anyone agree with us? 
there's there's a certain sickly pleasure in in aversive speech. Yeah, yeah. The the Buddha calls it the honeyed tip with the poisoned root. So he, he was fully willing to acknowledge that there's a certain sweetness to aversive speech, aversive uh, behavior, uh, but that it, it brings poison with it. Uh, so the attitude of renunciation, it's, it's recognizing, yeah, there, there is a certain sweetness that comes to aversive mind states, a certain sweetness that comes with harsh speech, uh, unkind speech, uh, but I'm willing to let go of that. I'm willing to let go of that because I recognize that there is a higher happiness. There is something more important. There's something more valuable. Uh, and I'm not willing to sacrifice and give up something more valuable for the sake of some lesser tainted pleasure. So the attitude of renunciation, uh, it's when you see that urge to make that nasty remark and it's just like, no, I can let this one go. Again, before uh, the meditation, we were talking a little bit about the eight precepts. How it can give one a foundation for starting to notice the impulses and tendencies of mind. So that we can start to break our habit of discontent and cultivate a habit of contentment. So, for example, if you've taken the precept of not eating after noon, uh, and it's 3 p.m. and you start to want a donut, well, then you see the thought arising and you're like, oh, I can let this go. This isn't doing me any good. It's just making me uncomfortable. Uh, and if I go out and pursue this, then that's just going to make me even more uncomfortable. Uh, and in the long run, it's going to weaken my self-restraint and lead to decline in my spiritual faculties. So instead, we practice contentment and renunciation and we let it go. We bring the mind back to contentment. It's like, well, I didn't have a donut a moment ago. I still don't have a donut now. And somehow everything is okay. Uh, so that's the practice of renunciation. Well, it's the same. I wasn't making a harsh statement a moment ago, and I was fine. I'm not making a harsh statement now, and somehow I'm still fine. So clearly I can be perfectly okay without engaging in harsh speech. Uh, or divisive speech, or malicious speech, or, or any kind of uh, aversive, grumpy, irritable speech. So the practice of renunciation is the willingness to let go of our old habits, the willingness to let go of our impulses, uh, the willingness to let go of those momentary desires that, that pass through the mind, uh, the, mo the, the willingness to let go even of the deep set patterns and tendencies, uh, which we might think are intractable. But it's important to recognize that from the Buddhist standpoint, nothing is intractable. No matter how strong an impulse or tendency or habit is, it can still be broken, it can still be changed. And it can be changed immediately in the present moment. Uh, so by watching the mind, by seeing what's going on in the mind, by recognizing our tendencies and patterns, uh, by identifying what's wholesome and what's unwholesome, uh, and cultivating self-restraint, then we can change. Uh, so, um, for example, earlier today I was talking to somebody about the, the nature of evil. Um, and from a Buddhist standpoint, there's no such thing as an evil person. There's also no such thing as a good person. And what there is, is there's a person who's making bad choices and a person who's making good choices. So what we call a person is rather a conglomerate of choices. And it's not just past choices, it's present choices. Uh, so a person is continually morphing and evolving. Uh, and so uh, if a person is, is the conglomerate of their choices, then ultimately a person cannot be said to be either good or evil. But rather you can say that currently their choices are predominantly good or their choices are predominantly bad. That's what we can say. Uh, so looking at our own mind, then we can recognize no matter how many times we've made a particular choice, we can always make a different choice. 
No matter how strong a habit is, we can always choose to do something else. So the attitude of renunciation is taking that principle to heart and recognizing that we can let go of any unwholesome impulse the moment it arises or even a few minutes after it's arisen and we've already been running off at the mouth with all kinds of harmful, unnecessary speech, we can still recognize, oh, I can let go of this. I can stop this. I can drop it right at this moment. So then we can actually get to talking about right speech. Uh, once we have this foundation of, of right view and right attitude, we can talk about right speech. Um, so, in the context of the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha talks about right speech in mm, four basic categories. Uh, so, refraining from harsh speech, um, refraining from mm, divisive speech. So, divisive speech is speech that's meant to set people against each other, to create conflict uh, between people, to weaken relationships between people, to weaken a sense of positivity between people, so creating negativity between people. That's divisive speech. Um, and I should make a certain aside here. Uh, so if someone is engaged in a toxic relationship, encouraging them to end that relationship is not divisive speech. That's actually the proper course of action. Um, so that's, that's in a, a different category. So divisive speech is defined as uh, when people are in concord, trying to create discord. Uh, so using speech in a way that, that sets people against each other. Um, so harsh speech, divisive speech, false speech. Uh, so deceiving people. Uh, so malicious deceit. Uh, un, so telling lies. Uh, engaging in, in false, deceptive speech. Uh, so this doesn't include joking, but one does need to be careful because uh, we do sometimes use joking with the kind of hope that maybe there's a 10% chance that the person won't think we're joking. Anybody ever done this? You tell a joke, but you're kind of hoping that the person won't think it's a joke, that they'll take it seriously. Only, is this only me, really? Okay, a couple other people. So that would actually qualify as deceptive speech. That would qualify as a lie. Yeah, but it gets really delicate because you might be 90% joking, but there's 10% of you which is, which is actually trying to deceive the other person. So our mind is not always unified in its attitudes and intentions. This is also why it's really important to start with that foundation of right attitude, of right intention. Because you want to make sure that your attitude is actually 100% wholesome. Your intentions are completely wholesome. That there's no trace of unwholesomeness getting mixed in. Because that has a way of poisoning whatever we say and whatever we do. So really trying to purify our intentions as much as possible. And actually, if our intentions are completely pure, then we'll only make good choices. Uh, and as we cultivate awareness, discernment, and wisdom, uh, then on top of that base of wholesome attitude and wholesome intention, then not only will we always make good choices, but we'll also always make beneficial choices, choices that bring benefit to ourselves as well as others. So that foundation of right attitude, right intention, is, is extremely important. It's critical. Uh, and the fourth major category of, of speech that the Buddha spoke about uh, is refraining from useless speech. Uh, so elsewhere in the suttas, the Buddha gives a list of 32 kinds of useless speech. Um, and it's quite fun going through it. Talk of armies and heroes and robbers and kings and ministers and affairs of government and uh, whether things exist or not, and gossip and stories about uh, gossip about relationships and so on. There's, there's all this, these examples of useless speech. Uh, and the Buddha says, instead we should speak words that are loving, 
beneficial, and worth treasuring. Uh, so speaking words that are connected with the Dhamma, speaking at the right time, the right place, the right audience. Uh, and uh, of these, I particularly find this, this phrase, worth treasuring. The Pali word is nidhanavati. So worth treasuring. Um, so asking yourself this question before we speak, uh, are, are these words just, just trash? Just junk that, that people will instantly forget without carrying the slightest bit? Or even worse, is it trash that the other person will hold on to? Just junk that's filling up their mind with more useless noise? Or is it something truly valuable, something worth treasuring? So it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be incredibly profound, uh, but rather that we should always be trying to use speech in a way that helps people become better people. We should always be using speech in a way that helps people incline towards awakening, helping people incline towards uh, virtue and wisdom. So speaking words that are worth treasuring. Uh, and, and again, this also relates to uh, the manner in which we communicate. Uh, so you can say something that's, that's useful and valuable and beneficial, but if it's communicated in a harsh, unkind way, uh, then you might get a negative reaction. Or even if the person looks past the manner in what you're saying and looks at the content of what you're saying, even if they appreciate the content of what you're saying, the fact that it was delivered in a tainted, dirty package has an impact. It does have an effect. Uh, it creates this kind of poisonous feeling in someone. It's kind of like if someone's starving uh, and you give them a sandwich and you're like, oh, by the way, this sandwich has poison in it. And the person's like, well, I do really need to eat. So on the one hand, thanks for the sandwich, but Seriously, did you really have to give it with poison? Was that really necessary? Um, so it's the same. We might be delivering something that's important and valuable and beneficial, but if we deliver it in a poisonous way, uh, it's, it's kind of like, like sticking in a knife. Uh, just totally unnecessary. This extra layer of unpleasantness, which is not necessary. Uh, so again, being careful. Uh, so communicating words that are gentle, loving, beneficial, uh, at the right time and place. Uh, words that are worth treasuring. Uh, words that, that help us incline towards awakening, uh, both ourselves and others. So not, not making that distinction between self and other. Uh, but just speaking in a way that leads towards liberation. Uh, leads towards contentment. Uh, leads towards... Uh, freedom from dukkha. Uh, another important element of right speech uh, relates to admonishment and criticism. Uh, so this is a, a major element of Buddhist practice. Uh, so uh, there's a number of places in the suttas where the Buddha talks quite directly about this. Uh, there's one place where the Buddha says, uh, this is the basis of progress. Uh, in the Dhamma, mutual instruction, mutual admonishment, mutual improvement. Uh, so it's the willingness to receive the viewpoints of others, the perspectives of others, uh, as something valuable that can show us a side of ourselves that we may not be clearly aware of, that can help us see what we need to work on and improve. For example, in the Dhammapada, the Buddha says uh, that we should see someone who points out our faults uh, as being a guide to hidden treasure. So if someone came in here and was like, dude, there's this like, huge chest of gold just buried in the ground, and if I can tell you how to get there, then we'd be like, oh, why yes, I'm quite interested. Uh, so it's the same way. Someone comes in and says, I really need to tell you You've been a little too rude lately. The way you've been speaking is a little too harsh. You might want to try to do something about that. We should have that same reaction of like, thank you. Thank you for pointing out this treasure, this treasure of knowing what I can do to get closer to enlightenment, of knowing how I can progress along the path. 
So the Buddha gives a number of very useful instructions for how to give admonishment properly and how to receive admonishment properly. Uh, and it's interesting that he gives a lot more instruction on how to receive it properly. Uh, because who here gets a little bit annoyed when someone offers constructive criticism? Anyone? Okay, a few people. Okay, that's not surprising. So do I. Because uh, it's, it's quite easy, because what do we do? We take it personally. It's like, oh, well, how dare they say there's something wrong with me? Don't they know that I am perfect? I am clearly the paragon of all that is right in the world. Don't they know this? Don't they know that my choices are mine alone and have no impact on anyone other than me? And of course, I have the wisdom to know what's good for me. Don't they know this? Uh, but actually, uh, what we know is that this is utter idiocy. Uh, we know that the choices we make do not define us. They're just choices that we can change at any time. And actually, if we've been making poisonous choices, then by all means, we certainly should think about changing them. Uh, and since it's not who we are, we can let go of them at a moment's notice. So you might think, oh, well, I'm, I'm the grumpy, sarcastic monk. That's me. It's like, no, that's not true. I'm a monk who sometimes is grumpy and sarcastic, but that's something which is not, not the definition of who I am. Uh, it's just choices that I've made in the past. So it's something that can change, something that, that we, we have the ability to shift so that we can be more in line with Dhamma, so that we can be more in line with the path to awakening. So recognizing that, that self grasping that tends to get wrapped up whenever we're criticized. It's like, oh, how dare they criticize me? Well, they're not criticizing you. They're criticizing choices. Choices that you've made in the past, but it's the choice themself that, uh, themselves that are being criticized. Mm -hmm. So, not taking it personally, uh, but recognizing instead that what's being attacked is not you, uh, per se, but rather what's being pointed out is that certain sorts of behaviors are unwholesome and lead away from awakening. Uh, and in fact, if the admonishment is coming from a fellow Buddhist practitioner, uh, then hopefully the advice that they're giving is because they want to help you make progress towards enlightenment. Uh, possibly not. Uh, so there is, of course, always the peer review process, and you are, in fact, the peer reviewer on this one. So someone might say to you, uh, mm, you've been excessively harsh, but then you reflect and you're like, no, actually, I wasn't harsh at all. This person has it wrong. Uh, or they might say, uh, oh, you need to change your behavior, but then you reflect and you're like, no, actually, my behavior was completely wholesome. Uh, there's actually nothing wrong here. But the important thing is the reflection, to reflect and consider, is there truth in what they're saying? Is there benefit in changing my conduct? Uh, if I take their advice to heart and act accordingly, will it lead me closer to awakening? And if the answer is yes, then we should seriously consider doing just that. If the answer is no, then we can safely discard it. Uh, but always going through that review process, whenever we're admonished or criticized, uh, instead of immediately rejecting it or immediately taking it on, that would also be a mistake. Uh, if somebody offers us uh, admonishment, they might actually be completely wrong. So we shouldn't automatically agree with them and accept what they say either. Uh, I mean, it's still good to thank them. It's like, thank you for telling me that. I will reflect deeply on my ways and improve what needs to be improved. But then actually reflecting, it's like, well, is this admonishment in line with Dhamma? Is it true? Is it beneficial? Does it lead towards enlightenment? Uh, and if, it's, if that's the case, if it fits those criteria, then we should make an effort to, to change our ways, uh, to get in line with the path towards awakening. Mm. So not taking it personally when we're admonished. Uh, another major element is that we often don't want to change what we're doing. We're deeply attached to what we're doing. Uh, we're deeply attached to our behavior patterns and habits. And recognizing that for what it is, it's attachment to dukkha. That's it. Uh, there's a really lovely quote um, from one of the medieval Indian Buddhist 
uh, scholars, and I, I can never remember his name, so I really need to look it up one of these days. Uh, he said, we hate dukkha, but we love its causes. So this is the nature of our defilements, of our unwholesome behavior patterns. Uh, we hate the dukkha caused by these behavior patterns, but we still love to do them over and over again. We have this deep attachment to my ways of acting, my ways of thinking, my ways of speaking, even though it's causing us pain. Uh, there's this deep attachment, this unwillingness to change, this unwillingness to be otherwise, to do otherwise, to act otherwise, to speak otherwise, to think otherwise. So looking at that attachment and recognizing its foolishness, its futility, uh, and making an effort to, to relax our grip, uh, and, and often just recognizing the dukkha that we're causing to ourselves is enough to loosen our grip. Uh, when we see clearly what we're doing to ourselves, then naturally we tend to stop. One of my first Zen teachers, uh, Linda Ruth Cutts, uh, she said, uh, if we could see what we're doing to ourselves, we would burst into tears. Uh, and this, uh, again, when we reflect, uh, on the sheer amount of dukkha that we inflict on ourselves on a daily basis. It's just horrifying. It's just mind-blowing. If we inflicted that much dukkha on other people, then we would be a torturer. But we do it to ourselves all day long, and we don't seem to recognize the problem here. So when someone delivers a genuine admonishment, what they're doing is they're helping us see the dukkha that we cause to ourselves and helping show us the way out, helping show us the path out of that. So it's important to be receptive to uh, admonishment, uh, even if we don't like it, uh, being receptive to it, because often there's something valuable that we can put into practice, which brings betterment to our own life, uh, as well as making us a, a better person, a person who causes less harm and more benefit to others. So, uh, and the Buddha also spoke about giving admonishment. Uh, and he gave five particular criteria for giving admonishment. Uh, so we should make the resolution uh, to speak only what is true, uh, to speak only what is beneficial. Uh, and beneficial here means uh, helping people make progress towards awakening. So speak only what's true, only what's beneficial. Uh, to speak at the right time. This is a really important quality. Uh, so we have a saying in, in monasteries, uh, never admonish someone right before lunch. Yeah, it never goes over well. Even if what you have to say is completely true and completely beneficial, it's probably not going to be terribly well received. Wait until after lunch, when people are fat and happy and they're just like, ah, oh, okay, what did you want to say? Oh, yeah, 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 I get it. I need to work on that. But before lunch, everyone's always a little bit on edge. It's usually not the right time. Uh, so watching out for that, watching out for time and place. Uh, another example of this is that uh, most people don't like to be criticized publicly. Uh, so it's usually better to, to speak to someone in private uh, or take them aside and, and speak, speak quietly. Uh, because, uh, again, when we speak publicly, then our ego gets all wrapped up in things and we become very self-conscious and aware of our reputation and so on. And, of course, that's all a bunch of silliness and self-inflicted dukkha as well. Uh, but it complicates things. So we want to minimize the complication. Uh, receiving admonishment is difficult enough at the best of times. Uh, so we definitely want to keep it as simple and straightforward and easy to receive as possible. Uh, and of course, the Buddha said to speak gently and to speak with a mind of metta. Uh, and this last quality, uh, he said, mm -hmm, to speak with a mind of metta, not with internal aversion. 
So this is another one that's really worth watching out for because sometimes we, we check all the other boxes. We're like, okay, it's true, it's beneficial, it's the right time, I'm speaking gently, and I really can't wait to give it to him. He really needs to hear this, that jerk. Well, just looking at that, looking at that, that little internal charge of aversion, uh, that, little, that little voice inside that gets a little bit of glee out of saying something uh, pointing out somebody else's faults, uh, noticing that and recognizing, oh, that's poisonous. It's poisoning my mind uh, and it also poisons the admonishment. It weakens the effectiveness of what I'm saying to the other person. Uh, it adds this extra layer uh, of dukkha to the whole thing. Uh, it's like the old saying, adding insult to injury. Uh, it's like, well, we don't really need to put another layer of unpleasantness. Getting criticized is already unpleasant enough. Um, so the Buddha did give quite, quite a bit of caution uh, around the giving and receiving of admonishment. Um, but it's important not to discard it entirely. Uh, because, uh, again, the Buddha said that mutual admonishment is the basis of, of progress on the path. It's extremely difficult to make progress purely on our own. It's possible, uh, but it's very slow and it's very difficult. Uh, and one of the main reasons for that is because we're so incredibly blind uh, to what we're doing. Uh, we're quite oblivious to our own patterns uh, in ways that are often much more clear to the people around us. Uh, so being open to that, uh, being open to receiving instruction and advice from others, uh, even if it's, it's related to things that are unpleasant, things that we're not willing to let go of. In fact, all the more so if it's related to something we're not willing to let go of. So, uh, right speech, uh, again, boiling it down to its basic principles, be nice, that's it. Um, uh, again, there, there's another lovely old saying, uh, everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. Uh, it's actually quite relevant in Buddhist circles. What do they teach you in kindergarten? Be nice to each other, speak gently, share. Yeah, it's true, it's true. <laughs> Be nice, share your stuff, don't hit people, speak gently. It's like those basic things that we teach to six-year-olds and then immediately forget. Um, but actually, if we were to follow kindergarten advice, we would be much happier people and we'd be a lot closer to enlightenment. Yeah, so uh, again, the basic principles of goodness in Buddhism. Don't do harm. Try to bring benefit. So applying that to our speech. Be nice and try to bring benefit to others. Uh, and this will lead you unerringly uh, towards awakening. So I think that's more than enough for one evening. Uh, we have a few minutes left if there's any questions or anything anyone would like to discuss. Go ahead. Um, a habit pattern that I've noticed in myself uh, is the tendency when I'm with somebody else and feeling um, some sort of negative emotion, uh, whether that be anger or